Seeing no further introductions, it's therefore time for a member's statements. The member from Niagara West Glanbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to uh, acknowledge that recently the government decided to prorogue the House and in the process of doing so, unfortunately swept off of the order paper uh, my bill, Bill 182, the Compassionate Care Act. Now, although I wish to acknowledge that this government has taken steps in the budget uh, that was tabled to uh, address some of the gaps in palliative care, there's more that needs to be done. And in response to this later this afternoon, I plan on tabling uh, my bill, the Compassionate Care Act, once again in this legislature. The Compassionate Care Act is not really about death at all, but rather about life, about living the good life and having a good death right up to the very end. The Compassionate Care Act is an act providing for the development of a provincial framework on hospice palliative care. At its very core, the Compassionate Care Act is about people. It's about helping people, honouring people, respecting people, and loving people. Palliative care focuses on the relief of pain and other symptoms for patients with advanced illnesses and on maximizing the quality of the remaining life. It may also involve emotional and spiritual support, as well as caregiver and bereavement support, and provides comfort-based comfort care as opposed to curative treatment. Last time the Compassionate Care Act came up for a vote in this House and received the unanimous support of the Legislature, and I hope in the future to receive that once again. I look forward uh, to seeing the bill tabled this afternoon. I look forward to bringing it before the Legislature for a vote as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the member statements, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I rise today to recognize the City of London as the first Ontario city to join the United Nations Safe Cities Project, led by Inova, a local agency that provides shelter and support for those who have experienced violence. The project is a five-year initiative to create a community where women feel safe from sexual violence and harassment in public spaces, including city streets, transportation, and schools. Last year, a survey conducted by Inova found that more than half Half of London transit riders had experienced some sort of sexual assault or harassment, especially on routes that serve Western and Fanshawe students. Speaker, we know that urban planning and built environments have a huge impact on how women experience their cities and neighbourhoods. Dark street corners, poorly lit pathways and infrequent bus service not only put women at risk, but also create barriers to their ability to participate in community activities. Avoidance and pepper spray are no solutions. Women deserve to live in cities that treat them equally, respond to their needs, and reduce their risk of violence. This week, London City Council approved the implementation of a digital mapping system to pinpoint areas of the city where people feel unsafe. Once identified, community partners, including residents, local businesses, and civic organizations, will work together to tackle the safety problems. Speaker, I congratulate the City of London and Anova for their efforts to make London a safer and more inclusive city. Thank you. Thank you. For the member statements, the member from Trinity Spadina. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, I rise today to speak to an issue that is uh, very important to me and to my constituents of Trinity Spadina. Mental health will affect every each one of us at some point in our lives, and I'm proud of this government's uh, unprecedented response to this very important issue. Soon after I was elected, uh, I was at CAMH to officially open the Gerald Chef and the Shanitha Kachin Emergency Department, which improved and doubled the space available for 24-7 care for patients in crisis. In October 2014, I was there when this government pledged $12 million to fund mental health supports on university and college campuses. In our 2017 budget, this government committed more than $500 million over five years to expand and improve the autism service and support across Ontario. And just last week, I was with the Premier and a few ministers at CAMH to announce a four-year four investment of $2.1 billion in mental health care. This is the single largest investment of its kind in Canadian history. We're revamping the way that we address mental health in this province, Mr. Speaker, we are improving the access to service, staffing, school, uh, staff, staffing schools with mental health workers, and creating youth wellness hubs and creating more support in, house, in housing units. We have a plan, and it's time to act now. Thank, Thank you. you. Further member statement, the member from Fargo. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Excuse me. This weekend, we're going to be celebrating Easter with the Christian community, Passover with the Jewish community. We just celebrated Nowruz with the Persian community, and they all welcome in spring with the hope for peace and prosperity in their communities. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. I just want to mention, unfortunately, while we're celebrating, we also have to remember that there's still too much hate in many of our communities. Chabad Flamingo, a synagogue in my neighborhood, had a rock thrown through its glass doors just last week, and uh, more needs to be done, Mr. Speaker. So I'm calling on um, all those in my community to work with representatives such as CJA, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs. Um, on their initiative, they just sent over 200 letters to my inbox, and I'm sure many here received some letters as well, calling on the government to do more to help vulnerable communities, not just religious communities, but LGBT communities as well, to help in giving them support in the face of hate. Because it's not enough to commemorate, we have to ensure that we're doing all we can to make, to, uh, to make our communities as safe and as strong as they can be. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member statements. The member from Temiskimi Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. It's recently come to my attention uh, that the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services is considering changing uh, regulations for firemen. That all firemen in the province have to be certified, and this will could conceivably cause some problems for volunteer fire departments throughout the province, particularly in Northern Ontario. This isn't a case about training. All firefighters across the province are trained, but if you look at a case of volunteer fire departments who have full-time jobs off the fire department, who do their training on weekends and evenings, a lot of these people are just not going to continue being volunteer firefighters if they have to leave their jobs to become certified. The minister has said probably one of the solutions would be grandfathering the people who are already volunteer firefighters. But in the long term, that doesn't solve the problem either because they won't be able to recruit new ones. So we have to take a longer look at this because if we lose volunteer fire, de fire departments in communities across the province, we will lose total service. Elk Lake is a good example. Reef Terre Vizette explained it to me. They have no OPP. They now have no ambulance service. They have no first responders other than the volunteer fire department. And these people, they need an option other than having to take time off their jobs to get certified. We need to look at this before this regulation is changed, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements. The member from Kingston and the Islands. Mr. Speaker, this afternoon I will be debating my private member's bill, Bill 26, the Fee Waivers Act. And in the past two days alone, our office has received dozens of letters and outpouring for, of support from law students, legal professionals, legal clinics, numerous other diverse service providers, and concerned con community members from across Ontario and Canada. Studies show that low-income members of the community are disproportionately susceptible to losing their government-issued ID or having it stolen. And among many other diverse cases, evidence indicates that perpetrators of domestic violence will withhold their victim's wallet and identification as a tactic to lure them back into the home or, worse still, keep them from leaving. Many choose to leave their IDs and, consequently, their lives behind. Mr. Speaker, different types of ID cards can be as much as $35, and while this is a nominal cost to most Canadians, it can pose an insurmountable obstacle to the most vulnerable in our community. By waiving these costs for those who cannot afford it, Bill 26 tackles the problem directly. It will also help organizations who have been relying on parts of their own budget or external donations to financially support clients who require identification on a case-by-case -case basis. I hope that everyone in this House will support this bill, thereby increasing access to justice and building a more fair and just society for all. Thank you. Merci. Miigwech. For further member statements, the member for Kitchener Conestoga. Yes, well, thank you, Speaker. I uh, want to extend, of course, an invitation to all of you and all of you at home to the 54th edition of the Elmira Maple Syrup Festival. Oh, yeah. Speaker, we all know that when it comes to pancake parties, the world's finest flakjack jubilee spills out only once every year in Elmira as young and old pay tribute to the time-honored traditions of our sugar bush roots. And while we are proud of all the pure pancake topping perfection being pulled out by the bucket as we tap the sap throughout our region, Every year, there can only be one to win the award as the very best of the best. Speaker, after two years at the top this year, Maple Tap Farms is handing 
its candy-coated crown to Riverside Maple Products, whose tradition dictates will be the exclusive provider of syrup at this year's Elmira Maple Syrup Festival on April the 7th. The trees, of course, have been tapped, and I'm looking forward to joining the organizers and more than 2,000 volunteers across the region to serve the best pancakes in Waterloo Region. And with the Best Syrup Award already handed out, the only question left will be who takes home the honours in the annual pancake flipping contest. Speaker, not to sugarcoat things here, I want to provide fair warning to all corners that this year, while Joy Bats may not be on the plate at opening day, my teammates on the batter flippers are back to claim our prize victory and syrupy sweet bread rates in the annual pancake flipping contest. From Flak Jap himself to farm festivals, live music, pony rides, and the mobile sugar shack, there's something, of course, for everyone. So bring your sweet tooth on down to Waterloo Region. Celebrated sweet victory for the batter flippers and join in the fun of the 54th annual Elmira, Elmira Maple Syrup Festival. We'll see you April the 7th. Thank you. The member's statements. The member from Beaches, East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I would like to recognize today Sir Thana Srithas for receiving a Leading Women, Leading Girls Award. This award celebrates women who demonstrate exceptional leadership in breaking down barriers and encouraging women to get involved in careers where they are underrepresented. Sitharsana has been an active member in our community of Beaches, East York, and I commend her efforts. So I want to provide a brief overview of her various accomplishments and contributions to her community. She received her Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Toronto Scarborough. And there, as president of the Scarborough Campus Students' Union, she represented about 14,000 and continues to full-time and part-time undergraduate students. Under her leadership, Sir Sith Arsana has successfully championed several initiatives, which include establishing a food centre that aims to alleviate food insecurity on campus, the implementation of free feminine hygiene products in all the female and gender-inclusive washrooms on campus, and she has advocated for creating safer spaces through a gender-inclusive washroom campaign in collaboration with SC Colon Out and the LGBTQ plus student organization. But we are not done yet. She has organized student consultations pertaining to the University of Toronto sexual violence policy and contributed to the implementation and opening of the Sexual Violence and Prevention Centre. She, has also, uh, she is also an at, at-large member of the Scarborough Community Renewal Organization, where she brings forth student perspectives regarding issues including transit, housing and inclusivity. She has actively promoted equality and diversity and, importantly, has been a positive example to women and girls in her community. So, Speaker, I would again like to congratulate, congratulate Sister Sana and to commend her for all the great work she's done in the community. Thank you for being Thank here. You. Congratulations. Further member statements, the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to again express my support for the two hospital sites in Huntsville and Bracebridge. This has been a big issue in Muskoka for a number of years, especially since 2015, when the board of Muskoka Algonquin Healthcare proposed the idea of a single hospital site. This, this week, Huntsville Town Council was considering a motion to ask the province to dismiss the board and CEO of MAHC. I'm pleased that Council agreed to put that aside for a month while they meet with the Board, and I want to thank the Board of MAHC for offering to meet with Council to answer their questions. This motion was an unusual step, but Mayor Aitchison and the Council are doing their best to represent the views of the community. Unfortunately, concern that MAHC Board has already decided on a single site and is just going through the motions of listening to the public has the mayors of Huntsville and Bracebridge and the communities frustrated. To address these concerns, I encourage the Board of MAHC to be completely open with Council and release as much information as possible to the public. I don't want to put all the blame on Muskoka Algonquin Healthcare. MAHC is dealing with significant funding challenges. For some reason, MAHC did not receive its fair share of recent increases in hospital funding. While the government announced a 4.6% increase across Ontario, MAHC only received a 1.4% increase, not enough to keep up with salary increases required by collective agreements signed by the province or increased energy costs. I call upon the province to increase funding to MAHC in order to ensure two fully operational hospital sites can be maintained. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank all members for their statements. It's therefore time for reports by committees. Reports by committees. Last call for reports by committees. Introduction of bills. Member from Nickel Bell. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I move that leave be given to introduce a bill entitled Peter 